episode of the task series today evening of academic academy of uh, global obstetrics and gynecology and uh, shield connect uh, together bringing this uh, task webinar so task stands for uh, trending ask series where uh, trending topics are discussed i'm pleased and i'm honored to invite dr anirajan chavan sir chair is the unit chief for uh, lpm medical college and hospital john hospital treasurer foxy uh, vice president mogs and uh, sir is as uh, various publications to its credit i welcome you sir i welcome you to uh, invite the chief guest and guest of honor today sir thank you uh, dr stalin uh, we go ahead with our trending task series uh, number 9 and uh, we have got wonderful topics today and i would request you to please uh, call upon the slide of our chief guest none other than the ever young the southern lady the southern i can say uh nothing less than a film star and she always rocks she has been there uh, for more than 3 and a half decades with us in obstetrics and field of gynecology having her own practice in trichy and chennai having her own center she has done a wonderful job when she was the past vice president of foxy and uh, she is also the emeritus professor i would like to invite Dr. Jayam Kanan, Madam, to be our chief guest. Thank you, Madam, for gracing the occasion and being there with us. Please, we request you to please uh, throw some light on today's program and welcome, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Niranjan. I am always part of any program of Niranjan and Komal Chavan. I'm very happy that Komal Chavan has become the best uh, committee chair of this year, and. Uh, regarding this program about the recent upcoming topics every topic in gynecology is very very important so far as the woman goes couple of months ago i was topic talk, talking on vulvo vaginitis but when a woman who gets the irritation then only she knows how important is that topic so probably topics like fibroid endometriosis and the pearl coated avalas very interesting topic of abnormal uterine bleeding all these things are all very important topics but when the woman comes in particular every problem of her becomes very very important and uh, i have been asked to speak on the gynecological challenges of a disabled girl when i went through the topic i did not get any material in the books of textbooks of gynecology whereas i get wonderful materials from social obstetrics i am very sure niranjan sawan with his academy of this global obstetrics and gynecology he will throw lights on these sort of topics which are never touched by a general gynecologist thinking that yes disabled woman go into the field of they say handicapped person dealt with by neuro neuropsychiatrist neurologist orthopedicians and others but just imagine a woman who has had a cut injury and she has to tackle her menstruation every month that becomes a very very important topic so i am very sure that uh, niranjan who is inviting people from all over the world are going to touch upon all these topics which are going to be of very very important and i am very happy that i am sharing this session with rishma pai with whom i have got 50% of my years of experience and then i have finished 51 years of my obstetrics and gynecological career 
and entering the 52nd year probably some of you may be only less than that age of mine but i am very happy that i am asked to be chairing a session with recent trends thank you very much have a great day have a great time let me learn something new from all of you i'll be there in this program thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thank you, thank you madam for those uh, wonderful uh, words which you have encouraged us all of us we never uh, ever grow old and always we are practicing obstetrician and gynecologist are the ones which give birth to life and the con and the thing continues so generation on generation and since you are in practice for 51 years i think grand grand mothers have been delivered by you and their grand grand children are coming now to deliver with you so it's an amazing phenomena right now i am in the third uh, generation you have already reached the fifth generation and i hope i reach there also with all of us colleagues there thank you madam for being there with us now i would like to welcome our guest of honor and uh, we have dr parul kothada wala from amdabad and he is a director and uh, surgeon endoscopic of the vs hospital and also the kothada wala women's clinic he is always at the helm of affairs whenever you talk about endoscopy about infertility being there as a managing committee member and it's a great honor that he is there with us today can you hear me yes sir yes sir you are audible sir yes yes i would request dr parul sir to please say a few words well thank you niranjan for uh, such high words for me uh, as dr jayam mentioned niranjan and komal i had the opportunity to be in the program today itself in both of their leadership the first one was isopar program and from there i joined this one so uh, i still remember the many years back when niranjan and komal had come to amdabad during bnb examinations oh it must be 20 years back or more maybe <laughs> yes, yes so but today's deliberations are all on fertility and it is very popular area for obgyn if you ask any youngster that what would you like to focus upon i'm sure more than 50% tell me fertility and that is why when i was a student when somebody asked me would you what is your interest area i would say something different and immediately the question would come not infertility i said everyone wants to go for fertility let me work on something else but indirectly through endoscopy i have also touching upon fertility quite a lot and i am sure that i'll add to my knowledge of non surgical part of fertility which is going to be uh, deliberated today i wish this uh, program all success i see dr pankaj here and he has been a hello backbone of ifs for fertility work yes. yes so yes uh, wish you I, all a very good have a good night yeah i agree i agree with you parul uh, that uh, even though you are an endoscopic surgeon and a general obstetrics uh, obstetrician we still touch upon infertility there are patients which come back to us and it's a beautiful subject you know the way things happen and the different uh, parameters which we see i think no one can miss out infertility even though he practices any other part but uh, endoscopy and infertility is very well connected and uh, it's really nice of you to share uh, uh, you know uh, your uh, memories with us and the same here it goes with us thank you so much parul for uh, you. giving your valuable time and you're not just going to be sitting there as an armchair uh, chairperson we want your expert opinion madam is there and uh, well she is the diva of infertility what can i ask more today <laughs> you know if she says yes and she comes for my program and the another uh, you know uh, the northern india giant i can say uh, uh, colonel uh, talwar uh, pankaj uh, sir and it's amazing that uh, uh, both of them have come here today i welcome now uh, our next uh, guest of honor and that's none other than ranjana khanna ranjana khanna madam is very uh, golden uh, lady with a, a warm heart
the way she has organized i have seen uh, with my own eyes and komal has also seen she is uh, uh, actually a founder president of praya uh, earth wisely known as uh, alhabad and of isopar of the alhabad obstetric gynec society and what a wonderful place you have ganga saraswati and jamuna meeting at that uh, uh, prayagraj and there is a kumbh mela and it was so beautiful place that we had a, a lovely time with her when we went there and we madam miss also the bad obstetric history which you had done the trilogy in delhi during your delhi. vice presidential year and it was so rocking and madam the way you smile and the personality you have i think uh, from one corner of the year to another i think there is no <laughs> other person who can smile the way you are and uh, well uh, you know uh, uh, we tire our muscles our mu- our facial muscles uh, can't take it but i don't know you are such a wonderful family uh, and your son is an orthopedic surgeon your daughter in law being there in an infertility and sir is being there welcome madam what more can i introduce you i request you to please uh, put forward your words and then we move ahead yeah a very good evening and uh, at the outset i would like to thank you dr niranjan chavan for this invite and it gives me great pleasure to be the guest of honor along with dr parul koddawala in fact in the last webinar only uh, just a few days back Dr. Parul was the main speaker, and uh, I think I exhausted him with the huge topic that I gave him: delivery of a patient with placenta previa, adherent and non-adherent. So, uh, the, Dr. Parul was amazed that the huge topic was given to him, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to chair the uh, to be the guest of honor along with you, Dr. Parul, and of course with Dr. Jayam as the chief guest. one of the uh, speakers of the day the first one is my most favorite dr rishma pai and uh, she is an excellent orator and who would know it better than me because i was one of the vice presidents when uh, in 2017 when uh, dr rishma was the president of foxy and uh, i tell you she is uh, a near perfect uh, pers- uh, persona i have uh, never seen a person who organizes events and everything with meticulous perfection and that is one thing rishma i have learned from you and that is to do things very meticulously i i really admire you for that and uh, your topic is wonderful uh, challenge of poor responders looking forward to hearing that and uh, the other speaker is dr pankaj talwar i have heard so much about you and uh, the birla infertility centers and uh, a lot i have heard about you my daughter in law has also uh, done fellowship in ivf which is currently in delhi and uh, she is the one who talks so much about you so uh, and you are going to take up a very nice topic on sperm selection in uh, ivf so uh, looking forward to this and uh, of course niranjan we are not just going to sit there we are going yes, to speak at the end also <laughs> because that is one thing you told me in the beginning only that you have to sit there hear everything <laughs> so we are there and i wish this program a great success thank you thank you madam thank you uh, well thank you so much madam for uh, your presence now we move ahead with our first speaker and i call upon dr reshma pai madam uh she is the assistant treasurer of uh, the international fertility federation society past president of our mumbai obstetric gynec society uh the iag sr and foxy i think she is has donned all the caps which no one else has got up till now and it's amazing that madam you have got such a wonderful uh, personality and you are practicing at dilawati at jaslok hospital a director at bloom ivf center and also have received frcog has got many many awards many awards i can say and that's what you have taken and representing india at the international uh, level it's amazing to uh, you know uh, be with you today and this is a diwali offer this is a diwali bumper offer and i could not get anyone except you are the right person to be here madam please uh, the floor is yours please go ahead we are waiting for uh, you to uh, hear your lecture 
thank you first of all i have to stop laughing <laughs> thank you i mean the praise is uh, heartwarming but at the same time embarrassing uh, i think all the people i am so fond of are here today and that's why they are seeing me through rose colored glasses and i'm getting all these wonderful compliments uh, which i'm not sure i deserve but thank you so much it's so wonderful like you said it's a diwali special for me too to be with all of you this evening so uh, thank you very much and uh, like everyone else i cannot say no to niranjan and so though i've been really busy uh, i am uh, here today Uh, and of course the subject is something very close to my heart and so um uh that makes it even more special can you all see my screen can my see uh screen be seen yeah yeah yes 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 madam perfect so i'm going to just go and dive right into the topic So today we are going to be speaking on the challenge of the poor responders and truly it is a huge challenge as you will see as we go along let me begin by saying that you can't spell challenge without change if you are going to rise to the challenge you have to be prepared to change and i think as obstetricians and gynecologists we are constantly ready to change because there's so much happening in our field in every aspect of our field dramatic changes are taking place in how we manage patients so what really is premature ovarian insufficiency it's a complex relatively understood entity uh, and it has a myriad of different etiologies and multi systems equally that stem basically from the premature deprivation of ovarian sex hormones so many different terms are used to describe the same problem whether it's premature ovarian insufficiency poor responders diminished ovarian reserve premature ovarian aging all really trying to explain the same problem in different ways all of us know that the field of assisted reproduction uh, we have made huge steps in this area but even today one of the most fundamental steps to reach success is related to the number of eggs that we can get so in poor responders unfortunately we get less number of eggs less embryos and obviously lower pregnancy rate and this is a rate limiting step really today we see that the incidence of poor responders is literally increasing and we've all experienced it in our practice and may range anywhere between 9 to 24% and unfortunately the pregnancy outcomes in these patients are really poor so what are the broad causes of this poor ovarian reserve of course each woman is going to face a physiological decline of a follicular heritage over a period of time especially after the age of 37 but some other common causes are obviously ovarian surgery like the one you can see on the screen for an endometrioma uh, importantly we don't often consider genetic defects and fragile x syndrome is one such common problem i'll just touch upon it in a bit of course if a lady is going through chemotherapy or radiotherapy has an autoimmune dysfunction is a chronic smoker has had uterine artery embolization for fibroids in the past all of these may have an impact upon her ovarian reserve and the reason i'm just touching upon fragile x syndrome is because not many people know about it or look for it in a patient who has poor ovarian reserve so remember that 20% of these women who develop fragile x associated primary ovarian if uh, insufficiency so large number of this group will have uh, premature ovarian insufficiency they also have obviously because of declining hormones they have menstrual dysfunction they have infertility and they might have dizygotic twinning and because of low estrogens bone health is impaired they also have neuropsychiatric issues and you should look out for them there may be tremors or ataxias anxiety depression sleep disturbances so when you see all this think of regalex and you can start uh, sort of checking for it and awareness of these risks and correlation of the manifestations will help us diagnose this condition and offer them uh, certain therapies which will be beneficial 
Another area which is often neglected is the prevalence of autoimmune uh, disease in this group of patients. You'll be surprised to hear that 40% of these patients had at least one confirmed autoimmune disease, whether it was Hashimoto's disease, SLE, art, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, Crohn's disease. So some autoimmune connection is often there. So when you see an unexpected poor aware and response person, make sure you keep a lookout for autoimmune conditions as well. So how do we really diagnose or come to a conclusion that this girl has poor aware and reserve? Of course, you see her age, you see her menstrual pattern, do a sonography, count the antral follicles, and of course, see the ovarian volume. And typically, we rely more and more on anti-malarian hormone as a simple blood test. I typically don't do day two, day three FSH, LH anymore, in even very, very rarely. And the dynamic tests like the clomiphene challenge test or the GNRH agonist stimulation test, I think really are not being done by anyone and really we don't have much uh, uh, information or knowledge or experience with them. So typically, remember, age is the single most important factor because age correlates not only with the number of eggs you're going to get, the number of embryos you're going to get, but also with the clinical pregnancy rates. Whereas all your other parameters like the antral follicle count or antimalarian hormone test, all of them correlate just with the egg and embryo number, not actually with the pregnancy rate of that patient. So age is really one of the most crucial indicators. Once we found all this, how do you define that this girl really is a poor aware and response person? So at least two out of the three criteria, if she fulfills off the Bologna criteria, then we can classify her as a patient with poor aware and response. Either she's had a previous episode of poor aware and response, uh, abnormal aware and reserve test, or she's more than 40 years of age. However, this Bologna criteria was established in 2011, and since then faced a lot of criticism. Why the age of 40? Supposing she is a poor responder, what are you gonna do for her? And so a lot of criticism gave way, obviously, to better uh, classification um, systems. And so uh, we have gradually moved away from the Bologna <clears throat> criteria and come to the Poseidon criteria which is the patient-oriented strategies encompassing individualized oocyte number. And here we have the patients being divided into four different groups. And this is really important because entire prognosis and management plans are now based on the Poseidon criteria. So the group one is a young uh, patient, less than 35 years of age. Tests are okay. AMH uh, more than 1.2, AFC more than five. Yet when you do a variant stimulation, the response is poor. Poseidon group two is a little older group, more than 35 years, normal tests, but a poor response. The actual poor responders are the group three and four. Group three is less than 35 years, low AMH, low AFC, and group four is more than 35 years, low AMH, low AFC. So once you classify patients into this group, uh, then it becomes very easy to manage them subsequently. So in this poor responder group, what kind of ovarian stimulation should we do? Should we keep giving them a very high dose of gonadotropins, whip the ovaries and make it produce eggs? There are many, many studies, including the Cochrane Review uh, fairly recently, which said that the evidence does not prove uh, provide a clear justification for adjusting the standard dose of 150 units. So they stick to 150, though there are other studies and uh, typically most of us also stick to a dose of maximum 300 um, units of the gonadotropin in this group of patients. Because they, you cannot, how much ever dose you give, you cannot create eggs or follicles out of nothing. Since the antral follicles are low, you can only stimulate the existing follicles. You cannot create follicles in vitro, in vivo, sorry. And so, uh, uh, you know, a lot of good studies and this particular study came in just last year, uh, comparing uh, uh, gonadotropin, long acting polypholytrophin alpha. Unfortunately, we don't have that in India right now, but I hope it will be here soon because particularly in this group of patients, it seems to work very well. 
in this study where they were giving good doses of HMG and the patients got a very poor response and did not get pregnancy. When they started with 150 micrograms of long acting corypolytropin alpha and then gave small doses of HMG with it, the patient started to produce eggs, gave a better response and got a pregnancy rate of 24% per ovum uh, retrieval. And so this particular uh, molecule works very well in poor responders. Even the Cochrane Review has studied something which many people often talk about, that as it is, you're going to get one or two or three eggs in these patients. Why give gonadotropins and waste money? Why not give oral, gonad uh, oral ovulogens like clomiphene or letrozole, give a few gonadotropins extra and produce the same one or two eggs? And there is definitely a positive to it that the cost is low, less amount of gonadotropins are used, but there is also a negative that there is a higher risk of cancellation and reduction in the number of eggs that are actually retrieved. So um, uh, there is definitely a role for clomiphene and or letrozole with gonadotropins, but uh, the results are little poorer than with gonadotropins alone. What about the down regulation? Should we use analog? Should we use antagonist? What should we do? And this was a very nice study in 2019 where they put the patients into three groups using GNRH antagonist, using long down regulation with GNRH analog, and using short GNRH uh, agonist protocols. And they found that typically the group which used antagonists for down regulation, they had more embryos being produced and cryopreserved. And uh, the long down regulation needed more gonadotropin because of extra suppression. But overall, the outcomes, the pregnancy rates, the live birth rates were very similar. So you can choose to use whichever method of down regulation and expect to get reasonable results. However, Sunkara uh, came out a few years ago with a really nice study where she said that the long GNRH agonist protocol increased the, use, uh, the number of mature oocytes by one. And just one more egg in this poor responder group actually increases pregnancy rate by 5%. And this is a fantastic increase in this group, which has a very poor pregnancy outcome anyway. So you can see in a girl, for example, who's 38 to 39 years, she gets three eggs instead of two using long GNRH analog protocol. And her pregnancy rate increases from eight to 12%. So significant increase with just one egg. And that's why there may be something for long GNRH analog. Of course, microdose flare-up protocols have been used for many years uh, with uh, in patients with poor ovarian responses. So small doses, 50 micrograms twice daily uh, on cycle day two, and then you start your gonadotropin stimulation on day three, and uh, you know fairly good responses are obtained. So all the options are open to us, and now we even have newer options, and. These are amazing new options because they are radically different. And that is using progestin primed ovarian stimulation. So you start your gonadotropins on day two or three as usual. <clears throat> And whenever you're ready to start the antagonist, when the follicles are, for example, uh, 13 or 14 millimeters, instead of that, you can start 10 milligrams metroxyprogesterone acetate orally. And it has been found in a comparative study that results are similar. So you can downregulate your patients with progesterone as effectively almost as with GNRH antagonist. You can also start this progesterone right from the beginning of the cycle. So you start um, gonadotropins uh, daily from the second or third day, and you start your medroxyprogesterone 10 milligrams per day, also from day three, and you continue it till the trigger is given. And you can actually see reasonably good or equivalent pregnancy outcomes. Very rarely, there could be a missed premature LH surge. So... Uh, Pregn uh, pro progesterone primed ovarian stimulation is now here to stay. For this particular group of people, the poor responders, we also have a, another protocol called the delayed start protocol. Because in this group, there is a very high LH and FSH, and this tends to cause the follicles to grow asynchronously and have a premature luteinization. And so what you do is you prime the patient, you start her on estrogen in the previous cycle, 
stop the estrogen, let her get her periods. Once she gets her period, you give her GnRH antagonist from day two to day seven. This reduces your FSH LH, and then you start the normal gonadotropin stimulation. And when your follicle is 13, 14, start antagonist again. So you're giving antagonist twice actually in this cycle, but this causes synchronous growth and better oocyte recovery. So basically, like I said, we are now centering around the Poseidon criteria and our stimulation protocols are also being centered around that. We are now focusing on what we call the FORT and POI. The FORT is the pre-ovulatory follicle count on your HCG divided by the antral follicle count. And the FOI is the number of oocytes which you actually retrieve divided by the antral follicle count. And you know this actually can help classify patients who have the best ovarian sensitivity. This is the group three, which is the young woman with a poor ovarian reserve. And this group of patients, what you have to do is adjust the gonadotropin dose, just give them a higher dose and they will do better. Whereas the group which has poor sensitivity, group two, which is the older woman with normal ovarian reserve, you actually need to change your protocol around. Just increasing dose may not help. So update on the management now based on this Poseidon criteria. So when we expect the patient to be a poor responder, which means group three and four, already you know that they have a poor ovarian reserve test. So you know that they're going to be poor responders. You automatically start preparing for that right from the beginning. And so in this group, the group three and four Poseidon, you can give GnRH antagonist or analog. The results are the same. Don't give very high doses of gonadotropins, not more than 300 units. We spoke about that already. And in some cases, you might give a combination of oral plus gonadotropin therapy, and that will also give you good outcome. The difficult part is when you get an unexpected poor ovarian response, that is group one or two. And this group of patients may have polymorphisms, single, polynu uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in the receptor or genes of gonadotropins. And there could be a variant of the beta subunit of the LH gene may also require higher doses of stimulation. So in this group of patients, you have to start with at least 50 units more of uh, gonadotropin. So though they are normal AMH AFC, they need higher dose of gonadotropins due to their presence possibly of polymorphisms. So uh, give recombinant FSH in many of these patients, use agonist or antagonist, give a higher dose, like I said, at least 50 units higher dose. And in the very poor responder group, LH supplementation may have a role to play. So combination of FSH LH may be better than FSH alone. What about add-ons, the uh, adjuvants? This is very, very popular in poor responders. They get a huge cocktail of drugs to try to improve their ovarian reserve. And many, many studies have been done on it. And I'll just rush through two or three just to mention growth hormone is one. Uh, you know, uh, they have shown that growth hormone supplementation may increase clinical pregnancy rate, number of eggs available, et cetera. And uh, however, it does not improve the live birth rate. So these are all very, very recent studies where growth hormone has been used. 7.5 to 12 IU have been used starting from the down regulation cycle in a long protocol. So throughout that cycle, they're given and still uh, the results may or may not be beneficial. Similarly, transdermal testosterone uh, using androgel can improve the responsiveness. The use of DHES may help by improving mitochondrial function and reducing the apoptosis of humulus cells. So there's a possibility that they may have a beneficial role to play. And the LH supplementation, and again, extreme poor responders uh, has seen uh, uh, to be beneficial, not in just borderline cases, but in moderate to severe poor ovarian responders. And so uh, to put it all together, DHA, coenzyme Q10, growth hormone, these seem to be the additives which work. Rest of the things do not seem to have a beneficial effect. But at this juncture, I'd like to say, don't be discouraged. It's often the last key in the bunch that opens the lock. And so what are the things we can do to improve outcomes? One thing we can do, and it's becoming increasingly popular, is luteal phase stimulation or double ovarian stimulation in this group of patients. 
it has been found that there are multiple two or three waves of follicular development in the ovary, not just the follicular phase, even in the luteal phase, a cohort of eggs starts to grow. And when there was uh, stimulation started in the luteal phase, it was found that people, uh, the, these patients were giving equal number of eggs as they did in the follicular phase. And so you stimulate in the follicular phase, give it a gap, do your egg retrieval, wait for two, three days, start the stimulation again. And again, in the same month, you can get eggs twice from the same patient, increasing the number of eggs. So do a stim as it's called, can be very comfortably done using GNRH antagonist for down regulation, GNRH agonist trigger, ICSI, and then you freeze the embryos. You can't obviously transfer them back in the same cycle. And then you start uh, second stimulation. And you can see that the cumulative live birth per intention to treat increases from 7 to 15% with duo stim. So quite a dramatic new approach to ovarian stimulation. Not only stimulating twice, even triggering twice or dual trigger in this group is shown to be helpful. So as it is, you give HCG along with HCG, give small 0.1 to 0.2 milligrams GNRH analog as well. And you will see that you get higher number of eggs and mature oocytes and better pregnancy outcomes. <clears throat> In this group, also you can do highly individualized egg retrieval. Get the eggs out a little early at 16 to 18 instead of later and you will get better results because you're preventing the premature luteinization. This is the only group of patients in which day two transfer may have a role to play. And you can transfer three or four eggs even. Everywhere else now they're recommending single embryo transfer. But in the very poor responder group, older patients, you can transfer higher number of eggs. And all of us are and have been doing for a long period of time oocyte pooling. So we do multiple cycles, accumulate a number of eggs and embryos, freeze them, make a pool of oocytes, and then the patient can be given fairly good chances by transferring back one or two embryos each time. And the cumulative success rate is very good. However, if everything fails, even today, many of these patients have to resort to egg donation. And you know that with egg donation, they will get excellent outcomes as good as any young patient will have. So the last part and short part of my talk is about the newer things that have happened, because we know that when we are faced with a challenge, we have to look for a way, not for a way out. And so what are the new ways that are being looked upon to improve outcomes in this very difficult group of patients? One thing that came in about uh, two, three years ago and has now become extremely popular is the injection of platelet-rich plasma into the ovary. And the patient's own PRP is isolated. It is activated. 5 ml is injected into each ovary, either under sonography or laparoscopy control. And it has been found that as early as two to three months later, you can actually see an increase in AMH, improvement in FSH, and the eggs begin to grow and you'll get uh, eggs in a patient who otherwise gave no oocytes or embryos at all. And there are many studies now uh, reflecting on the improved pregnancy outcomes in this patient. And I just put one study, you don't have to go through it in detail, just to tell you that this PRP works in many different ways because platelets carry more than 800 types of protein molecules, cytokines, hormones, and there are many biological active mediators which are released by this platelet, in, uh, uh, which include platelet-derived growth factor, transforming growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, insulin-like growth factor. There's more angiogenesis, anabolism, inf uh, inflammation control, proliferation. So you can see that one PRP is working at many different levels and patients who did not achieve pregnancy earlier have been, uh, you know, been able to achieve pregnancy after this therapy. Similarly, you can use autologous stem cell ovarian transplant called ASCOT. And these are bone marrow derived stem cells, which were mobilized into the peripheral blood by giving GCSF. Again, something that we are doing routinely 
and these cells in this particular study were delivered into the ovarian artery by intra ovarian uh, intra arterial catheter you can also inject stem cells into the ovary directly and there was a significant improvement in the ovarian function and more eggs and embryos could be produced from these patients uh, in vitro activation is a reality though much more difficult whereby under laparoscopic surgery, a piece of the ovary is removed and it is cut into strips and frozen. Whenever we want to use it, it is uh, thawed, cut into small pieces, basically to disrupt the hippo signaling. Then it is cultured with AKT stimulators for two days. It is washed and then retransplanted back uh, underneath the fallopian tube. And it was seen that in a short period of time, this ovarian tissue is actually activated and starts to grow and produces eggs. And they have been uh, reported patients. You can see in nine out of 20, they showed follicular growth and uh, three pregnancies were achieved uh, out after transferring into four patients. Uh, in patients who were otherwise completely not able to become pregnant because of lack of oocyte uh, retrieval. Then, of course, we have the mitochondrial energy transfer. All of us know that as the ovary ages, the eggs age, they have less number of mitochondria. And mitochondria are the energy factories of the cell. So when that reduces, you get poor fertilization rate, poor embryo development. And so many strategies have been employed to rejuvenate these ovaries, trying to do autologous mitochondrial transplantation. And this actually energizes the oocytes and may improve outcomes. And there are some studies from uh, centers across the world where they have practiced this autologous germline mitochondrial energy transfer, the augment technique, and they have shown pregnancy rates as fantastic. Pregnancy rates earlier were as low as 5% or 1.3% went up to 35 and 22% respectively after using this augment technique. And this is what they really did. The egg precursor cells were taken from a small biopsy from the ovary. They were cultured and frozen. And then mitochondria from these precursor cells were picked up and along with the sperm injected into the ovary, uh, into the oocyte during ICSI. And so this uh, mitochondria were infused into the oocyte, uh, activated them in a way and gave better pregnancy outcomes. And of course, this has been grabbing headlines Scientists grow human eggs to full maturity in a lab. For the first time, eggs have been grown outside the human body from the earlier stage to full maturity. So if you can actually get eggs out at a very early stage before the patient is undergoing, for example, chemotherapy, and you can grow them to full maturity in the lab, then you will have a lot of control over that patient's fertility. So also artificial ovary, and these all headlines which came out in the newspapers uh, in the West. And uh, this uh, paper was presented at one of the ASHRAE conferences. I was there uh, in 2018. And they said that actually you could uh, create an artificial ovary and you could, you could create a scaffolding of that ovary and you could actually transplant the patient's own eggs which have been retrieved much earlier before she underwent chemotherapy or cancer therapy or uh, uh, oophorectomy to me for cancer and then you can transplant those eggs back so much of this research is being done for fertility preservation for cancer patients but it is the same applications for patients who are losing their ovarian function uh, for other reasons very early in their lives and artificial ovary may become a reality in five or ten years and so very soon we will see this development happening and so let me end by a very brief summary that poor responders have significantly lower clinical and live birth rates. Increasing the gonadotropin does not increase egg, num egg number as the eggs cannot be created. Long GNRH protocol, microdose flare antagonist, all the protocols are equally good. You can in this group do an early embryo transfer on day two or three. Adjuvants such as DHEs, coenzyme Q10, and um, uh, you know uh, uh, coenzyme Q10, DHEs, all of them have been uh, growth hormone have been shown to have some beneficial effects. Finally, oocyte donation may be the best option in a large group of these patients. Newer technologies such as PRP, stem cells, in vitro activation, augment may have a role to play in the future. And the last and very important guideline to everyone is that keep the patient conscious of her ovarian 
uh, status of her fertility. And if we feel that even a young girl has a lower AMH, lower AFC, then advise for egg, embryo, or ovarian cryopreservation for future fertility preservation. Um, I always say, out of difficulties, grow miracles. And I had the privilege of meeting one such miracle, Lucy Brown, the first IVF baby in the world. Uh, met her at one of the American Society conferences uh, two years ago. And um, of course, it was a privilege to get a picture with her, as I had the privilege also of meeting this man, Sir Edwards, who actually did that case, the first IVF baby of the world. So that's a very young Rishikesh and me with Sir Edwards uh, himself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reshma. It was a wonderful lecture and uh, so much recent advances you have done, especially uh, you have talked about all the formulas which are there, the autologous methods which are there and really the challenge of poor responders is going to be very easy now. I call upon our esteemed guest of honours to give their expert comments. Dr. Ranjana Madam and Parul Sir. What to say, Dr. Rishma has given such an exhaustive and a complete uh, talk that uh, today we have benefited a lot. And I can say that, uh, Rishma, you have brought new insights into this problem. And uh, though I'm basically not an IVF person, but still, I'm doing IUI and all the other procedures. And I think this talk was wonderful. Wonderfully complete, if I may say so. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, Pankaj, are you there? You can have your expert comments with madam's lecture. Uh, no. How can somebody comment on madam's lecture? <laughs> this was just amazing, as always. Uh, thank you so much. Lovely lecture, ma'am. Thank you, Pankaj. Yes, thank yes. Uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, I think we can thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, I would like to tell you that Bloom IVF Academy has just been started one month ago. The directors of Dr. Uh, are uh, uh, Dr. Rishikesh Pai, Dr. Rishma Pai, Nandita Palchatkar. If you are setting up an ART lab, if you are going ahead and doing your future courses in IVF, please be free. It is available online. You can get in touch with madam. She is always warm-hearted to explain and get you on board. And it's a really amazing field of infertility. I remember uh, when I just passed my MD, my mom was a DGO, DFP and DPH. She did from said GS Medical College. And she used to feel so proud of me that whenever the, the patient used to come, uh, she used to make me sit besides her and uh, tell, this is more than me. And... Uh, uh, and uh, madam in infertility, I mean infertility in Marathi we call Vandatva. So I was not aware of this word Vandatva, but really she used to practice as uh, Ranjana madam said uh, at the level of IUI and all uh, and, see the, and see what has happened. So much courses have come, so much uh, technology has gone ahead and uh, it's really uh, amazing. It's not more a challenge now. So you all are welcome and madam I want to say we have got more than 2500 delegates who have logged in registered. So I am sure this is going to be very very helpful to all of us and especially the delegates who have joined not only from India but from abroad, Southeast Asian countries, Indonesia, Afghanistan, Nepal and even China and uh, some of them are also from uh, European uh, and African uh, countries. So uh, thank you, madam. And uh, you can be free and uh, uh, you can get in touch with Dr. Reshma Pai, madam. She's available or she, you can get in touch with me. Thank you so much, madam, for thank being you. here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now I call upon another uh, uh, great uh, teacher of teachers. He's an amazing person. Uh, uh, Pankaj Talwar. I met sir in 2016 and obviously we had interacted before also but we were together for the gynae oncology uh, workshop which was uh, conducted by Dr. Rishikesh Pai, Reshma Pai madam and it was such a wonderful uh, you know honor for all of us to being there. The first time in India IFFS had uh, done this wonderful uh, five days infertility workshop and sir was there he was a part of the whole program 
and then the journey continues and we can see now he is doing wonderful he left is the army now he is already uh, he was a secretary of ifs now he is the vice president of ifs ifs is the indian fertility society he is the head of birla fertility and ivf he has got many many courses course 1 course 2 course 3 we will talk about that later he has received lifetime achievement award from the ifs society has edited many many books has got his own research and uh, even i call him up and if there are patients in delhi if i have to refer or they are absolutely from the army background they are usually welcome by sir and of course the general population i hand over the mic to sir now to go ahead uh, with a very very interesting and a very different topic i had a discussion with sir and he said that niranjan this is the in vogue this is the in vogue thing and something about selection of sperm how do you select we have got so many problems we are going we have got such a technology and i would love to speak on that and sir we are all ready to hear from you the mic is yours please go ahead thank you sir Uh, thank you, Narendran. Is my screen visible to all? Can yes, everyone see yes. my screen? Yes, yes, it is. Thank you so much. I am in the hospital. Sometimes, you know, the signal pops in, pops out. In case something happens, just bear with me. Uh, so, well, thank you so much for inviting me here, Doctor Jim, Doctor Parul, uh, Doctor Ranjana. Thank you so much for saying kind words about me. Narendran uh, is always a delight. Uh, you know coming for your meetings they are just fantastic thank you so much for inviting me again dr rishma is always you know it's a big challenge it takes me nearly 30 years i told her before also that when we have to anyone has to speak after her it needs courage and training in indian army for 30 years to be here today i have to hold my breath and uh, hold on to my courage and then come on the screen He is always a very kind-hearted person and always encouraging our juniors. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a wonderful talk. Without much of adieu and greetings to all my seniors here, and I'll start my talk. That's about the sperm selection in ART. What's new? The topic is pretty recent one. My screen is not moving. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Hang on my screen. So fine. So when we think about infertility. Uh, we had a long, lovely lecture by Dr. Rishma Pai, and he spoke about various protocols. We do so much for a woman, and we are trying to generate such beautiful golden eggs. That's the aim of any IVF cycle. And for that, we have got such lovely, lovely laboratories, incubators. We send crores on embryo culture. Incubators, microscopes, big laboratories. We spend crores on setting up the laboratories, primarily to look after the women but when it comes to men we have the small plastic bottles costing 10 15 rupees 30 rupees and few drops of semen cell i think sir pretty good we see them see them under a microscope and but in the end the male doesn't have much therapy therapeutic measures to record his uh, fertility parameters as compared to a female and things are pretty okay And what all we can do? I'll take your, I'll take you towards this uh, lovely picture where somebody is trying to make a cocktail here. And if you look at this, look at in this cocktail, when they mix various things, one good thing I learned from them, they say that we have to shake it only fourteen times, and not fifteen times or thirteen times, because fourteen times is bit much more, and thirteen times is bit low. Same thing happens with the men. When we prepare a semen sample, and what we find here is that we use a centrifuge machine here, like we do use a cocktail shaker, maybe Boston or a French one. So we here we use a centrifuge machine to make the good semen sample. So an objective sperm selection can lead to increased pregnancy rate and decreased abortion rate. That's our aim. That's our aim of moving forward. 
I have with me around 18 minutes from now. I have to speak for you, uh, speak to you for around 18 to 20 minutes. And whatever I'll talk to you, we'll be having a lot of daily practice points, day-to-day -day application, and they should be simple to perform. By no means, I'll go into big scientific data. By no means, we'll learn so much that we become cerebral heavy, have an edema, and then follow like an empty What I won't cover would be the specific procedures and protocols and methodologies. I'll give you an overview about what we are doing for the men now. I'll be drawing my courage from this Cochrane review, which came in year 2019. There are multiple papers which are available to us, but I will be focusing more on the Cochrane review. To select a good sperm, we are normally banking upon this double density gradient media, which we use for doing an IUI, and similar ones we use for IVF. We are hopeful then when we are doing double density method, we are able to get a good Uh, 480 or uh, 78 BCB, they call it. The battle between Spartans and the battle between Athens with Spartans won. So this is a very lovely picture, but a hateful picture. Here they say that any, any boy who was born in Sparta was not of good quality. They call it a good quality, who had some deformity, was thrown off the hill. So they could make good warriors to win the war. That's the way somehow we are working on, on various technology to select good quality sperm. Okay, so look, look at this picture. This picture I have taken from an internet article. You find that as they are going up, there are a lot of hindrances which come in its way, which collect the sperms of good quality and only the good ones are able to move up, the rest all ones are decimated. So out of millions of sperms which are deposited, only few are able to reach the fallopian tube and out of them only one or two are able to fertilize. And they are the ones who have good morphology, who have got DNA integrity, and they are actually good quality sperms. So around 500 reach the apana, and only one is able to fertilize that egg. So the sperms are being deposited, and when they're moving up, they are facing multiple challenges, multiple hindrances, obstacles, and they go through various structural, fluidic, ionic, and molecular environments, and only good ones are able to move up. And whatever I'm going to talk to you today, the newer advances are based upon internal milieu of the woman per se. Natural sperm selection occurs how? It occurs on basis of pH. The vaginal pH is acidic. The semen pH is alkaline. So how, when the sperm they start moving, they are exposed to the change in the pH, change in the temperature, mucus plug, immune response and chemotaxis. All these things are going to oligospermia or mild, moderate oligospermia, then sperm selection becomes even more difficult. How do we carry out an exclusive sperm selection? Because you look at the generations of evolution. We find that initially we were trying to find 
or locate a good sperm by doing microscopy. We were subjecting them to their density, that is the weight, speed, and morphology. And as these sperms, we apply these techniques, we also found that we can do something like a hyaluronone binding assays. We know that eggs have got, the, all the OCC complexes have got, they are very rich in hyaluronone. And sperms have got hyaluronone mm. receptors. They're called PH20 and acrosin receptors. The sperms which can go and bind with an egg, they should be having these PH20 receptors. And they are the ones which have normal DNA and normal morphology also. Then we went one step ahead. We began with XC, came to MC. And here we could magnify the sperm and catch a good quality sperm and carry out IVF or ICSI. Then we had multiple obstacle courses and we were doing something called microfluidics where we, make, we made the sperms move in small channels. Small laminar channels we created in a plastic pit, small plastic plate, and that was called microfluidics. We were not tired. Came up with a new technique called magnetic sperm, uh, sperm separation in which we were banking upon these sperms, binding to a small magnet, and then they were selected on basis of their magnetic charge. The latest one in the market, the new kid in the town is called Zeta Potash. We bank upon the negative charge on the sperm and bank upon that negative charge being attracted towards the positive charge. And that's the way we use polycarbonate filters or, or we use some barricades and we select good quality sperms. Now, these are a few methods which we have. We can see density, surface charge, morphological characteristics, and a lot of them are there. So what I will bring you here, the take home message is that we were trying to select a good quality sperm and the option which we had always with us was a double density centrifugation method. Like we wash our clothes, we use a centrifuge machine and get good quality sperms. But now we are moving one step ahead. And these are the techniques which are available to us. And I'm gonna do a review of literature of which technique is better. Do the sperms use heat sensors? We know that sperms come from a lower temperature. So they always move towards higher temperature. And in case they can move better towards a higher temperature, they're good quality sperms. This is one of the concepts, like a, like a missile which fires, it is fired and it follows then um, a target which is warm. That's called warm guided missiles. The sperms are moving towards a warmer perspective, but they are cold and they want heat. So they move towards the areas which are warmer. And a sperm which has got more capacity to move towards a warmer, sperm, warmer uh, egg or warmer milieu, that could call it a sperm. So we have got chemotaxis, we have got thermal taxis, and we have got a lot of other methods by which sperms they try to find an egg. Probably they are able to smell an egg, or they are moved towards certain chemotactic factors. This is microfluidics, which we are using nowadays. You know, microfluidics has become a very very basic investigation, and I think we use it in around forty to fifty percent of our cases. They need microfluidics. We are moving further. And then nowadays we are applying magnetic beads, magnetic carriers to select our sperms. And that's the brief background of our talk. What we find is that nowadays the sperms are becoming weaker. They are fatter. They are tired. They've got a bad morphology. And this occurs more commonly in the men who are fond of nicotine, smoking. James Bond is a person of past nowadays. Drinking, smoking, cheers, midnight. Even women do it. This is cycling, sauna bathing, and a lot of other things. Power games, health drinks in the gym, taking sauna, mobile telephony, eating like me, I said. We all eat like him. Gaining weight, being a couch potato, mobile telephony in our pockets, and then always worry, fear, anger, sadness, self-esteem will lead to reactive oxygen species generation, and that lead to oxidative stress <clears throat> and infertility. 
So one thing we have learned is that there is high level of ROS found in the body and they can lead to decrease sperm motility, viability, DNA integrity, and increase mitochondrial defects. They'll have lower in vitro fertilization rates, poor implantation and early pregnancy loss. So let's see what all we can do to select good quality sperms. That's how to go beyond centrifugation, how to go beyond using double density gradient methods. And one method is that nowadays we are trying to avoid centrifugation. Just picking up the sperms under by simple swim up by microfluidics or by just the migration techniques and using them for ICSI. Our aim is to choose few good sperms. We are not bothered with large number of sperms now because we are doing ICSI in majority of cases. The sample to be selected, how to select the sperms, it all depends upon the basic semen parameters. But we should try not to centrifuge. That will be my second take home message to you. All of us who are doing some sort of IVF work, now we avoid centrifugation. This is one point I want to put across here. But by that, we can have better quality sperms coming to us. Though there are indications of doing everything, we do centrifuge, but depends upon the initial presenting features. So non-centrifugation based methods are the better methods. The newer options. Let's see the buzz in the market. What's happening at the market? What all is happening globally? A lot of things are happening. What Dr. Dishma brought out very beautifully. I just add on to the male factor. There are very nice articles from HFE and multiple bodies all across the world. They gave us a consensus statement about add-ons. They said we are having a big IVF add-on racket. And we are pushing women and men towards needless extra. many randomized trials and same thing Cochrane also says. <clears throat> Patient expectations, market forces, online information are driving us towards picking up newer technologies by which we separate our sperms. Sperm selection in male infertility. There are multiple articles, multiple papers are available, but one thing is for sure that we are adding antioxidants, we are adding new, new techniques. Nearly three quarter of all the men are undergoing some sort of treatment. Traffic light, light concept by concept by HFEA, they say is whenever we do is pick up a technology that should be either green or amber or red, meaning we already know. So I would like to say that when you pick up a technology for sperm separation, that should be ideally green or maybe amber Red technologies, we should be now discarding. There are 10 techniques which we follow. I have not used all the techniques, but majority I have used. We have... Um, bio fringes, which we use along with the XC, and we have surface charge selection, which means that here we are carrying out zeta potential separation. Surface charge selection means that we have to know that any mature sperm will have a negative charge. Jobi sperm acha hai, which has got good DNA, good morphology, will have a negative charge. The negative the charge, healthier is the sperm. So we put a, we just take the tube, rub like this, that creates a positive charge. And then the negative sperm will stick to the wall of the tube and they can be separated. That is called separation by zeta potential. Now what they are doing is that we have, we agree that this is a good technology, but nowadays they're putting small filters. They're putting polycarbonate filters and sperms have to go through those filters. They have created one more hindrance 
for the normal morphology of normal DNA. So once you put those electrophoretic devices with filters, you are able to select better spots. That's the way they do it. They put such polycarbonate membranes. So sperms they move from negative to positive side, and what will get stuck to that plate will be a better quality sperm. Under research, this is still under research. But as per Cochrane, this is the finest method we can use for sperm separation, and that may be the right method for the future. Sperm apoptosis. Any sperm which opens up and the inner sperm membranes come in open, they express phosphatidyl serine. It's a, it's a glycoprotein which contains phosphate and serine. So when they open up, they attract an action. Action is a complementary protein, which is which we have in the laboratories. So we put we put with an action small iron beads. So an action and iron beads will go and stick with the sperms which are open, which are damaged, and then we separate them by using a magnetic beads put outside our test tube. This technique came up in our country. I've used it for few couple of say 15, 20 cases. It's a good technique. But somehow, again, it is going off the hook and it is not easily. It is called magnetic sperm separation and it works on the magnetic properties. Fertilized in. And his sperm, which has got good pH 20 receptors, will only go and bind. So, we, there's a natural way of sperm selection in vitro. So, for that, we use small plates which are binded with hyaluronic acid. And the sperms which go and bind with these micro dots, we are selecting them and carrying out ICSI. The technique is called PICSI and it works upon hyaluronone binding or small micro dots which contains hyaluronone. And then we pick up the sperm from these micro dots and carry out ICSI. This technique came up in a very big way and we all used it. I think we would have, would have done around four, 500 cases with ICSI. And uh, this was around seven, eight years back. But now this technique is also gone. Then came a new media which contains hyaluronone. And this media is coming from a company called Origio. And uh, it's called sperm flow. Yes, we use it for ICSI. So multiple techniques, multiple methods of sperm selection are there. A good, good thing which came was microchambers. Here we use these small microchambers and plates, which will make the sperms move in small microfluidic chambers. As you can see, there are four wells, and they move with the pressure gradient, and they move through these small microchannels. And only good quality samples or sperms will be able to reach the other well. It's a very good method. We create chaos and then we, we use a nascent sample and then we allow them to go with some pressure head under some pressure and they move towards these micro channels. And we also have a method that is sperm, which is not a good sperm, that will keep moving straight. But a sperm which is a healthy sperm, which always move left and right. That's part of capacitation. So a good quality sperm will always move towards right or left and go to a well, which is lying at a distance. But a bad quality sperm will always keep moving straight ahead and go to the collecting jar, collecting well, and there are bad quality sperms. So this is microfluidics we are using very frequently. And this is actually the future of seminology in the coming few years. I'm sure that we all are using it day in, day out. And in coming few days, I think, and we have microfluidics for IUI also, where you can prepare a sample without even spinning it. The advantage is that we use micro laminar flow. We don't spin. There is no centrifugation. And everything is sperms, they move in a laminar flow. And then they collect. As you can see, they go, go up in a well and they collect somewhere and all the bad sperms go to a different well. All WBCs and pus cells, they get collected in a different well. That's one technique. 
around seven, eight years back, a new technique came, big way, sperm biofrenches, where they use some sort of lens and ICSI. It works on the principle that sperm has got protein filaments, and when the light will hit them at a particular angle, they'll biofrench, they'll shine. And any sperm which is shining better, that can be selected and you can do ICSI. So here we use polarized light microscopy. So sperm biofringes, more it is, better it is. So we are selecting sperms by their glow or biofringes and then carrying out ICSI for them. This technique was came up with a big uh, confidence boosting mayor, but somehow it didn't catch on. That's the way sperm had biofringes uh, worked, but it's gone out of uh, vogue now. Then came MC and ICSI, ICSI VR. Because if you know that we look at a sperm at a magnification of say 300x or a 200x, but that wasn't enough. The technique came from Israel, which magnified the sperm to 6,000 times. And by this particular technique, we are able to select good quality sperms, which have got good DNA and good acrophone. As you can see here, the top image is of ICSI and the lower image is of MC. It was a great confidence boosting measure, and we thought that we're going to do very, very well. In fact, I think Dr. Pai reported the first MC baby in the country also. So, but gradually, MC is now no longer recommended. It's gone out of vogue. We're not using MC anymore. XC we are still using. So, MC, I've told you, that could magnify better and we, could, we were able to collect, collect a good quality sperm. Understanding the perspective, yours and mine perspective. So, all the ladies and gentlemen who are around the, across the screen, what is our perspective? Do something more. It should have some research element. Do no harm. Reproducible outcome. Auditable outcome. Need to treat. Entity is very important. Don't spend money because they can spend. Patient's perspective. Counseling and hand-holding. Expenditure is a concern for them. And they want good outcome. And they want a thing which is not totally expendable. They should be actually treating them. Discussing the present traffic lights. Applying it to our country, my take would be that these are the various techniques available to us. I just spoken to you about all the techniques. MC is red light, so we don't use MC. Pixie is red light. We don't use Pixie anymore. It is not to be used. HOS or the mortality um, technology is green. We can use, we call it HOS, HOS testing. XC is green. Magnetics. Sperm sorting is in amber. I'm not very confident about that particular technique. Heta potential is amber. It is one technique which is going to become green very soon. The white density gradient method is green. DNA fragmentation index is actually amber moving to green now. And one technique which we all are using day in, day out is microfluidics. by the patient's uh, demands and we are we have to understand that all the patients want, wants evidence-based treatment. Our technologies are being driven by their expectations, market forces and online, online infographics. Pressure from patients and commercial interests are forcing us towards using certain technologies which we should not be using actually. That's what I want to convey to you. So out of these all six or seven techniques which we are using, I think the only technique which is doing us good is sperm selection by any technique which doesn't involve centrifugation. And the ideal technique which we can all adapt is microfluidics. We still have time to discover the new technologies. Just reviewing the Cochrane, Cochrane says that there is no technology which says that one is better than another. And that's the way the Cochrane always works. Cochrane never gives you the proper answer. We have reviewed around 10, 15 articles. The only technique which has got potential to come up in a very big way as per Cochrane is Zeta Potential. Zeta Potential and microfluidics we have to watch. There is low quality evidence that high learning binding techniques and XC, they give us better rates as compared to ICSI only. 
There is no other technique which is compared with ICSI or microfluidics, which is giving us a better outcome. So I will like to end my talk. The future is ours. We have to respect the men when they come to us. And I think we should all now gradually move on to the non-centrification techniques. And the technique which I have learned in my life, which works very well, is microfluidics. So with this, I'd like to end my talk. Thank you so much for the patient hearing and I'm ready for any queries from your end. Thank you very much for the patient hearing, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pankaj, sir. There are words of appreciation for you and for uh, Madam. Amazing lectures, the technology which you have said and uh, so much equipment and so much uh, work has been done in the last, especially in the COVID times. And the results are really, really good. Uh, Jayam, Madam, you are also in the same field. Uh, you can please uh, go ahead with your expert comments. I always used to get amazed with the Talwar's lectures when I see in the websites. Because he used to send his lectures in series and I have looked at it. I am one of the subscribers for him in yahoo.com. And his today's explanation on the various aspects of this newer technology since sperm can only be understood by a research embryologist. I don't even think my daughter Priya Kannan, who was a president of Association of Embryology, could know so much about this mark and other procedures. I used to think about mark in 2000, but as years went on, as I could not see many results, many outputs, I did not take it up. I am one of the person who started with CASA work in India. I purchased the CASA equipment, HVMS. And in the last 10 years, I have understood it is more for research purpose and not for clinical purpose. Clinical purpose still remains the morphology and the motility. And even this, uh, this in size and structure of these sperms, it's amazing that when by Kruger's criteria, they give 3% as morphology, the patient shows pregnancy in the next cycle. Spontaneous, I used to wonder. Because I have gone through all these uh, lectures and uh, these Kruger's criteria in 1990 so much. I have gone through these uh, workshops. But still, I'm really amazed by the constant touch with which Pangaj Salwar wants to express his views on the sperm technologies. Keep going. And the research is really required for us to know why from 3,600 million sperms in the birds, we have come to even accept 36 million sperms in human beings. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing, sir. I got words of appreciation. This is Dr. Alpana. Uh, she has sent a lot of flowers and heart signs. Excellent. There's Dr. Kanchan Sharma, very good topic. There is uh, Shakuntala from South India, excellent presentation. We have got more than 2,573 members who are there. Oh. And this is a Diwali bumper. I can say I would like to share with all of you. Sir has got his eye seat. He has got the basic to advanced clinical andrology, IUI, USG courses and uh, these are hybrid eight weeks courses course one course two and course three i am sure the people who have joined i think more than 551 delegates have registered up till now from probably more than 40 countries i can see the flags but i can't identify those flags and sir you are uh, it's a one-to-one -one training a lot of efforts have been done by you and i think uh, the efforts which you have taken are really gone there are so many youngsters who want to be a part of, uh, you know, learn IVF, learn endoscopy, 
knowledge is power knowledge is uh, infinite you cannot just uh, be a general obstetrician and gynecologist and i think you are spearheading it in a very good way sir and uh, it's really nice especially during covid times people have really gone back to books and basics and they have started learning and this was never before ever people used to just go to the conferences meet and uh, just be a part of few lectures but things have really changed and you know when you are just sitting there probably uh, in your clinic or probably in the operation theater or just outside or probably cooking somewhere or maybe feeding your baby around and seeing uh, you know opd patient you just put on this uh, wonderful webinar just listen to it and it's amazing and uh, thank you so much sir for uh, being there with all of us i hope you can see uh, the network is uh, co going quite good thank you so much both of you uh, this is dr naga sandhya pankas sir is a walking encyclopedia so it's amazing uh, dr ranjana would you like to say something yeah i would just like to say that dr pankaj your talk was really very good and uh, it uh, opened uh, lots of new vistas into this problem and uh, it was amazing very nice thank you ma'am thank you so with this uh, uh, we would like to wind up our uh, uh, wonderful trending task series 9 uh, and uh, i would request now dr stalin to come on and give the vote of thanks this was the uh, diwali bumper we will get back to you after diwali have a good time but uh, be safe continue your masking keep safe distance and uh, just avoid to be getting infected with any uh, of these problems which we are there but i'm sure i think we will not have third wave but probably we have to be really careful and uh, it's very proud feeling that india has crossed more than 100 crores of vaccine yeah. and uh, that's why we are all much better off as compared to the other countries thank you madam thank you all of you i hand over the mic now to stan happy diwali to you and dr jayam and dr pankaj and happy dhanteras too and lot of festivities ahead <laughs> yes yes ma'am thank you ma'am i would like to thank dr jayam kannan ma'am uh, for your gracious presence and encouraging words and i also like to thank dr parul sir and dr ranjana kannan ma'am uh, for joining with us uh, this evening in spite of your busy schedule i would also like to thank dr rishma pai ma'am for that wonderful informative talk and uh, poor responders uh, thank you dr pankaj sir uh, for your uh, uh, presentation with wonderful pictures and a lot not uh, dr i would like to thank dr chavan sir for your constant support and guidance in making this series successful uh, not but not the least i would like to thank the participants for their active participation thank you all happy diwali advanced happy diwali sir Thank you for these efforts.